Once upon a time, there was a golden age of music in the highlands when harps, fiddles, pipes, and drums accompanied events, great and small, battles, marches, assemblies, salutes, laments, all boom and keen they were before the clearances drove the fiddlers to America and the pipes into service of the government that had defeated them. All that music and the world of the clans out of which it had grown stood in the way of a new economy and the Highlanders were too independent to provide the workforce. The forests and fields the peasants lived upon, called the commons, were nurseries of idleness and insolence, claimed the rich and allowed the poor to become much like the Indians of North America, enemies of progress. And so they passed laws that prohibited hunting on the newly fenced commons and drove the Highlanders from ancestral lands, burning them out and knocking down their dwellings to make way for herds of sheep. I come from those Highland Scots. We've always thought ourselves better than our oppressors. Yet we lost those battles, were herded together in grim cities, our sons sent to die in the Englishman's wars. Flowers of the forest became our theme, a lament for history's losers in the death march of progress and profit. Yes, we lost those battles, but here we stand, ready to join the next. My favorite flower is one you can pierce an Englishman's throat with. I was with Johnny in the highlands above Glencoe when he asks, do I know what my name means? And I say, yeah, from the waterfall. And he points to a cliff where the stream drops 50 feet to rocks below my waterfall. A raw and lonely place. Go ahead and scream, no one will hear. Beat your hands bloody against the stone no one sees. That's why I was there, on a trail above the valley of the River Co. You see, I come from those Scotsmen. My great-grandparents shipped to Canada during the clearances. Bitterness remains. My father's name was Glen. It means valley, a gentle name for a boy forced to harden himself against music. Me too. I'd come home to our grim past, prepared to play my part in an ancient conflict I'd been bred for from the beginning. You see, when I was a kid, Dad was always harder on me when we were up at Grandpa's farm. Saw me with his father's eyes, I guess, afraid of the outhouse at night. Routed by charging pigs, I'd stumble into stinging nettles, fall down, and always on the trip up, I'd get carsick. Grandpa made me a coonskin cap and tried teaching me to shoot, but he was always too busy with his dairy herd or logging operation. Knuckles greasy, spotted with blood and dried milk, and for supper, we ate the meat of a black bear he'd killed. He never let Glenn help, so he'd just stand there smoking while I slipped away to a broken down tractor in the blackberries, pretending I was grandpa. Jaw clenched, cap pulled low. I jerked levers and yanked the world into place, just like 
grandpa. A Scotsman born of orphaned immigrants to Saskatchewan who belonged to the clan MacDonald. And that means something even today. See, during the Jacobite uprising, when the Campbells worked secretly for the British, their fighting men were billeted with the MacDonalds in Glencoe while a peace treaty was being ratified by clan chiefs elsewhere. But after enjoying their hospitality for weeks, the Campbells rose one night and murdered almost every one of them. Aye, when violence sweeps through the highlands, there's nowhere to hide. You have to choose and you're always just one wrong turn away from a field of corpses. Don't go into the military, son, Dad said. Slow to enlist himself even after Pearl Harbor. He didn't want to fight, had dreams of Hollywood, playing trumpet and taking singing lessons. He finally signed on as a medic, but had to carry a gun anyway. We killed a whole troop of Filipinos, he said, because a translator misunderstood. And then he got shot, got malaria, and lay in a hospital bed for months, just one wrong turn away from a field of corpses. And like Grandpa, Dad died young. Stomach and liver cancer, both of them. I tell myself it was from the chemicals Grandpa accidentally carried home from his job as a boiler maker. But maybe we share more than I want to believe. We all have the stumpy legs of Highland Scots, don't we? Johnny's legs are long. Tall and bearded, he looks like King James with eyelashes that touch his cheeks. Talks endlessly about the old religion, law, and magic. And when I question him, though, he just lowers those lashes, looks at me silently, and then goes right on. I want to make a confession, he says. We're in Edinburgh, beside stone walls. Above on the hillside, a castle. Below, the gallows where rebels were hanged. The woodworking business is just a cover. What I really do is sell hashish. He slits open a tailor-made, shakes the tobacco into rolling paper, crumbles in hash, rolls it up. We smoke and look at the gallows. Two days later, we're breathing hard on the trail above Glencoe, hashish in our packs. Every autumn, after the harvest in India, Johnny and his buyers gather near Glencoe, far from the eyes of the law. But we're coming the back way this time, and I have to choose. There's no place to hide, and I'm just one wrong turn away from a field of corpses.